Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of In Nature's Realm. Now today, I'm not going fly fishing, but I am going to the Call to Fly Fishing Club. Now the Call to Fly Fishing Club has asked me to do a fly tying demonstration. And in particular, teaching them about the Mayfly life cycle and the flies to tie that will imitate each stage of the Mayfly life cycle. Now the flies that I'm going to pick tonight are flies that are easy to tie. They're flies that work really well. And um, most of all, they're tied with materials that are easy to find and select from your local fly fishing tackle shop. Now a little about the Colder the cold Fly Fishing Club. What a club, you know. These guys are just fantastic. Every member is they are just absolute champions. They just recently did a kids day at Riddles Creek. They organised fisheries to uh, fill the lake there with trout and the kids had a ball. The kids were learning how to cast. They were fishing for trout, catching trout and um, I was involved. I was tying flies, and giving away flies to little kids, bringing a great smile to their face. It was just a fantastic day. So that's what the Calder Fly Fishing Club is. It's a fantastic club based out of Gisborne. And you know, if you wanted to join a fly fishing club, this is definitely a club you need to join. So stay with us. Um, soon we'll be doing the fly tying. So we'll see you real soon. What we're going to tie uh, tonight is flies that are for the mayfly life cycle, which is what the trout are feeding on, or the insects that the trout are feeding on right at this very moment. Places like Newlands, Hepburn Lagoon, uh, Moorable Reservoir, quite a number of different places. Harcourt, even right up at Harcourt, you know, the duns will be hatching there and um, all the mayfly. So we're going to cover each stage of the mayfly. Now the very first stage of the mayfly is the nymph on the bottom. So what the nymph does, he lives under sort of like wooden debris, under rocks, those type of material on the bottom. And then when he gets to the right size and it's the right time of the year, and I think water temperature's got a lot to do with it as well, this nymph will then rise or ascend to the surface and become the emerging nymph. So we're going to cover this first fly is a fly that's going to imitate the bottom stage where the actual nymphs are on the bottom and the trout are feeding on them. So you won't see the actual trout food on them, all right? You can only make an assumption that they're at that stage and then fish this fly that we're going to tie and then, you know, we'll fish it with an action that's going to imitate the actual nymph and then, you know, that's, that's what we're going to tie first. Now the fly is called a, either a seal's fur nymph, a brown seal's fur nymph, which is probably already, some of you already know how to tie and so forth. Um, and, but you don't have to actually use seals for it. You can use any material you want, you know, and it could be antron, it could be uh, super fine dubbing. Um, so there's a whole lot of different uh, types. So the, what you'll need is a hook, about a size 12, which everyone's got a hook in their vice, all right? So, you know, this is just so that we can learn how to tie it. Doesn't really matter with the size. You want to get particular with the size, you know, you can do it at home later when you tie your own flies. So the materials you'll need, and I can give you some of these materials, all right, is the Indian cape, all right. Now this, you've got two types of capes, all right. People don't realise this, but you've got genetic cape, and those are called Indian capes, or from the same sort of like bird, but of different quality, all right. This would only cost you twenty dollars, all right, at a tackle shop. That will cost you one hundred and twenty dollars, all right. So that's the difference between these two. Now we're just going to use that for the t well. The tail is going to be our first one. So what we want is just one of these feathers from the tail, 
and I'll take my glasses off so I can see better. And we will select a feather. And we're just going to take a bunch of fibers off the side of the feather like that. Just get a little bunch. And then we're going to even it all up, all those fibers up, and have a nice straight bunch of fibers. Now, to tie the actual, um, it's good to have the thread on there first. <laughs> so I'll just put that on. And when you tie the thread on, tie it at the point where you want the forex to start. All right. So if you tie to that point, you've got a marker as to how much material you use up to the body part. And then after that, you've got the forex. So I start my tying thread at that point there where I'm going to start the forex. And then, so, take my scissors, cut that excess thread off, and then advance the thread down to the bend of the hook. When you're in line with the barb. So that's where we start the actual tail. So if everyone can do that, and if you need a feather, just let me know. All right, so, get the fibers from the side of the feather, just grab a small bunch, and then even them all up. And then when you've got it nice and even, tie in the tail. And judge the proportion, your hook shank should be the length of the tail, all right? And so you, you get your fibers like that, and you judge it to the hook shank, all right, like that. And then you pinch it at that point there where you've got the length, and then you tie that in. And the pinch method is to go up, grab the thread, and then slowly bring it down. So have you got your, it through the, the end of the bottom there, you haven't got it right? Yeah. yeah it's got to be through... Yeah. 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 All right, so as you can see, we've got the tail on the on the bend of the hook. How are you going there, uh, Cooper? Mm. Cooper, your name? Yeah, yeah, Cooper. Yeah, you've got the tail on, no worries? Yeah. Beautiful, well done. Everyone else got that? Yep. All right, now, what we do now <coughs> is take some copper wire. Now this copper wire can be thick or it can be, I've got a medium thickness there. It's not super thick, but it's not super fine either. And that acts as the segmentation of the nymph that we're tying, all right? So has everyone got copper wire of some description? Anyone? If you haven't, I'll give you a bit. You've got and some? You start like that, and then you go like that. And when you build up your body, okay, yeah, we'll to, um, taper it from where your tail is, a fine taper, and then make it thicker and thicker till you get to the forex point, all right? You know, to make it perfect, you know, like, it'll take practice, you know what I mean? All right. Now, when you do the copper wire, so you, you rush the super bit there. If we tie the soup, uh, the um, the uh, dubbing material on that way, all right. So if we're going over, then we put the copper wire under, 
all right? Because what will happen is, if you do it the same way, the copper wire will get trapped in the material and it will disappear. If you do it the opposite way, it will stand out. So we go under and then, and you don't have to put any f real force to it, just a little bit. And make the segmentations nice and even. Yeah, about four or five, yeah, exactly. Now another thing you can do as well is you can tie lead on before underneath to weigh it down. Right, that's one way. Um, another way can be use um, tungsten uh, beads or lead beads or whatever. You know, um, there are different ways you can do it. But I I like actually using um, well that material absorb enough water to get it down. If you need to get it down further, if that's your preference, then you'd use lead wire before you start. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, what we'll do is put in a wing case, all right? Now, what I've got here is pheasant tail fibres, or a pheasant, pheasant tail, and we just want the fibres on the tail to create the wing case. So I'll give you some of that. Have you got some powder and um, if you need some? little bit higher on the tip then you can water it through. Yeah. Oh, I'll use the tail on it. I've got some in the house. Oh, I'm generous. Now what do you, do you use the top or the bottom? Uh, the, the base of it. Yeah, so the thicker end of the tail. Um, but I sort of come up a little bit, say, to about halfway, midpoint there get the because that's really thick there and then tie it in at the base there you can always put a couple of lines of thread first anyway so it's not going to matter yeah, and just wind around yep and go forward yep it's just the way inside itself okay so right down. Okay. and there yeah, right. well, got the wing case there. there you've got that in place yeah yep. all right now for everyone else get some more dubbing material all right, Cooper, get some dubbing material and create the four axe. Now, this needs to be a little bit bigger than the body in the amount that you would use. All right. Yeah, on the forex. <laughs> All right, now build up your body of your forex, and then once you've done that, then we can bring that wing case of your pheasant tail fibers over and tie it down as the wing case. All right, now when you've once you've done the forex, now bring those pheasant tail fibers over and make sure they're nice and even with no gaps bring that over and then tie that down into position flat or do you leave it up in the loop? Tie them over, flat. over flat a little, little bit of a gap like. well, if it's too flat I just find with, with a little bit of a curve you get that little bit of area what I'll do is the fish just sing a lot. I'll just 
Yeah. 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 Yeah, Cooper, these one off tight. And what I'll show you is to do the last thing once you've whip finished it, you've tied down the wing case, whip finish it, all right? Uh, now, the last thing is, after you've tied the wing case down and you've done your whip finish, right, the last thing to do is to get your dubbing noodle, all right, and just get the seals for fibres or whatever fibre you've got and just gently prick those fibres out on the sides, on the bottom, and even where the forex is. Because what we want to do, we want to emulate the actual um, nymph. The seal fur fibres will pulsate under the water. So the fibres, the loose fibres that you've got hanging out. Oh, they're mine. Yeah, right. Whose are those ones? Are they yours, are they? Or whose are those? No, they're mine. Oh, they're yours. Okay. I thought, these don't feel... They didn't feel the same in here. Yeah. Oh, it was a classic. And then um, do it to the forex as well. And then your fly underwater will look so much more alive. And that's what it is about fly fishing. We want to make sure those flies come alive. You know, if we were to tie a nymph out of plastic, it just wouldn't look alive, you know what I'm saying? So that's why we use materials like, you know. Exactly. Seals food is just the best material of all time, it really is. Now for this next fly, use the same hook we used before. I'm going to do it and you can mimic some off panda. And you'll find it easier to get. Right. Yeah. Is that what? 12? Yeah, 12. About a 12. Because once you see this, you get it and you'll understand it. So now, so we've just tied a fly that seals fur nymph for the nymph that you've just, the materials you've used um, to imitate the nymph down below. Now you won't you won't get any real suggestion as to when they're feeding. You just got to guess that. Now the next stage is where the nymph from the bottom will rise to the surface film, right in the meniscus, right, and it will sit there. And when a trout takes the emerging nymph, you'll see it. It'll be like a uh, like a, a, a ring, but you'll see the actual trout with his tail, you know, like his dorsal fin. You won't actually see his head. He'll just come up, suck it under. And then he'll move down. No. So that's you'll see, when you when you do get to see trout take the emerging nymph, you will really get to know what that rise form is like. All right, and that's the key indicator that uh, you use a emerging nymph pattern. Now this emerging nymph pattern that I tie, I could, it's something I developed just through just using experimenting with different materials. And as you can see, I use these bug bodies. All right, you can buy them in <coughs> tackle shop. tackle shops and they're basically uh, sponge rubber and I use that as the forex and the head and then the rest of the fly is just marabou. You put the uh, the brown marabou, you create the tail and then you have uh, the excess coming out, you tie it in and then once you've got the tail in then you just wind that marabou right up to the forex of the rubber and then tie it off and that's it. And what that does is it, the marabou absorbs the water and let's sit, hang down, and the little rubber sponge floats it right in the surface film, and it works a treat. I can tell you, it's fantastic. So, so what we do is we grab first of all. Let's tie our thread onto the hook. That's it, exactly. But sometimes you will see it, depending on where the um, the lights are like. Um, what size would be uh, on again, by the way? Probably about a 12, you know, 12 size hook. Um, 
Now that rubber, I've got to have one myself, so grab it out. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, see the pointy in that? See the pointy? Right? Where's Cooper going? I don't know what I'm Oh, there you are. Oh, all right. Okay. You need to tie this on so it's just hanging over the edge so that you can get your leader in underneath. All right? So you line your, your thread up where you want it and then you just... No, just bring the thread. Don't be too hard on it because you could snap your thread. All right? So do it gently and then tighten a little bit with each one. All right? And then you can start widening it backwards so you get more of the rubber onto the hook. Right. Like so. And when you feel it's nice and securely on, then you get the your scissors and you just snip away at that rubber at the back. Right. So you've basically got like that. So that? So that's pointy head, right, right. Is, is forward, all right, and you've got enough there to float the actual flyer, and then we want to trim this off just a, a little bit more. Be careful when you're trimming this off, because sometimes you can... Well, what you can do is get the time thread and tie the rest of that backwards, so you go back and tie the rest of that down. That's probably a better way to do it, like that. No, no, you don't need to if you do it properly. You know what I mean? All right. So once you've got that on, it's nearly finished. All we do now is we get some marabou fibres, and you want the longest you can possibly get. So you want about... That seems like that's good. See the base there? We'll grab about that much there, that much there. And we... Is this where you've got to find the ones that sort of, you know, if you give a bit of a wave, they sort of... Yeah, in the water, it pulsates and absorbs the water. So what you do, Cooper, all right, go up to the length of your tail you want. So you want it about there. Oh, sorry, advance back. Jeez, that'll help. So is this twice the length of the... About the length of the hook shank, maybe a touch longer, just so that you've got a little bit more action in it. And then tie that down. One, two, and then advance your actual thread back to that position there. And then what you do is you get that and you wind it around. Now this be very gentle with this because this marabou is very fragile. So All right. you're, you're winding it I wind it around, just winding it around, exactly. All right, so we're going around. I might do another one in the same spot there, just to build it up a little bit more. And then we tie that down, like so. And then that excess, we snip that off, like that. And then just advance, lift up that rubber and advance it forward. And then whip finish it and then it's done. done snip any extra fibers <coughs> and there you have it 
passer un. Now, once that's wet, it gives on the body of a nymph, gives the tail of the nymph. The nymph's actually swaying and waving, and that rubber sponge floats it right in the surface film. But when you put that marabou on, do it very gently. You've got to really like have a surgeon's hand, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's a bit of an exaggeration, but you know what I'm saying. You get the point. You know, be very, very, because it's very fragile. <laughs> All right, now the next fly that you'll find that the trout will feed on is from the emerging nymph, the, that forex there is where the dun will pop out. So that'll split open and the dun will pop out and he'll flit on uh, onto the surface. And what he's doing on the surface, he's wait, waiting for his wings to dry. So if it's a really windy day, the duns will dry out their wings quickly. On a real windy day, you won't see duns, right? You'll say, why is there any duns hatching? And the reason is because they go like this. Hatch, the wind's blowing a gale, right? Next thing, gone. They're flying full away. Where if there's no wind, they'll be stuck there. So on windless days, you'll have the duns floating longer and drifting with the uh, with the whatever wind there is for a longer period of time. If it's absolute blowing a gale, boom, they're gone. They're flying away. And that's why people don't see them. They think, oh, no, duns hatched today. But they did. They would have been freaking hundreds of them hatching, all right? So that next stage of the dun is, and what I've done here is, I've created the crippled, well, not I didn't create this one, but the crippled dun, all right? Crippled dun, all right? But it's exactly the same. We use the marabou for the tail and the body, all right? And then we use, say, a grizzle hackle, which is that hackle there. We tie that in as a hackle and we have the deer hair, the brown deer hair that I showed before. Where's that deer hair going? There it is there, as the wing. So what we do now, we do, have we got time to tie another one? Yeah, yep, all right. So let's get a hook. Sorry. As you were talking about the duck, hmm. so the longer they stay in the water, the more chance of fish. Yes, exactly. So people find the best weather conditions for the dun is where it's sort of like windy and it's amazing how nature works, it really does because these duns, say it's like a mill pond, right, and there's no wind at all, the duns won't hatch because they know, somehow they know that once they do get up there, their wings aren't going to dry out, it's going to take ages for them to dry out and they're subject to not only trout, but swallows, other birds, and so forth, right? So they won't hatch. So the best weather conditions are where it's sort of like a, a slight, either a breeze or a very light wind, just to create enough for them to come out, and then they'll drift with the actual wind, like a sailboat, right? And, they, and their wings will dry out after a certain amount of time. So they might be on the water for, say, a minute, two minutes, something like that, or... Or whatever but what you'll find they do is they once they the wings start to dry out they they flitter a little bit and then they go back down wait till their wings dry and then they flitter again and they'll keep flittering until they get to the edge of the lake like as you can see in that picture there they'll go if they hatch right at the edge of the 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 uh the bull bull rushes right there and then we're trying to get to the other side you know they would keep flittering and flittering all the way until they get to the edge and then they'll hide in the trees and wait for the right weather conditions for the mayfly spinner, which is the next stage. So from the dun hatches the spinner, all right? And the weather conditions for that are beautiful and sunny, no wind, because all they want to do there is they want to mate, the female and the male want to mate, and the male will die, become a spent spinner, and then the, uh, the female, all she wants to do is lay eggs, all right? And then those legs go back down, hatch out into a nymph. And that's the life cycle of the mayfly. All right? So the weather conditions for spinners are totally different. Like yesterday, I got an email from a bloke by the name of Norm, and he said the spinners, were per they were everywhere, Bruce. I caught a two, uh, pound and a half trout and missed a two pounder, he said. And that's exactly what the weather conditions were like. There were hardly any wind, so it would have been very calm around the edges on the lee shore. All right? And you know, it can be, 
you know, perfect for those spinners, which it was. And when uh, the weather changes to overcast and it's going to rain, it's going to be a bit crappy, all right, that's when the duns will come out. So that's what you can expect, you know what I mean? And then I remember reading, I'm an avid reader of David Scholes' books, and David Scholes always preached the fact that, you know, you go down to the rivers, and if, the, if there's no wind, it's going to be a great red or orange or red spinner hatch. And he said, if there's any wind, forget it, right? So I, through his reading, I went down to Tasmania over, I don't know, about 12, 15-year period. Once a year, I'd go down there onto the rivers. But I noticed along the rivers... There was like big, so like those reeds there in that, that photo there, which would create just a small patch of calm water, right? Blowing a gale, right? But there was just one or two feet. And as I'm walking along, I could see all the spinners just in that small patch of calm water. And there was thousands of them. So I started watching them thinking, hang on, this could be interesting, this. And then all of a sudden, trout, bang, taken, bang. And then it was hard to get your fly drag free drifted because the base of your fly line was along the really fast flowing you know, the, through the wind and the, your leader, or say part of your fly line and your leader was in the calm. So what would happen is that would pull and then drag the fly. So it was hard, you had to really put a mend in your line each time. But if you did it and you got it perfect and they sort of like took it at the right time, bang, you know, you'd catch one. So it was then that I realised that you know, in certain conditions, you don't actually have to have really calm, windy, windless days. You know, those spinners will hatch. The, the, the greatest chance they can get of hatching, they'll do it. You know what I mean? So it's something to be um, mindful of. You know? So, yeah. All right, so we'll tie this done next, which is 14. Size hook. I don't want that long shank. I definitely want it smaller. Yeah, that size is perfect. All right, let's put that that hook into your voice. Yeah. And then we'll tie off red. Yeah. Now with this, we're going to tie. Yeah. We're going to tie the wing. We're going to tie the wing on first, all right? So what we do is we get our deer hair. Have you got any deer hair, um, Cooper? No, but not near. You haven't got it here. All right. No. And we want to tie it on a 45 degree like that, all right, so it balances out. Don't tie the wing in like that, all right? Tie it like that, okay? So catch a small bunch. So about that much there. About right. And if you've got a wing stacker, that can help a little bit, but you can get it even without a wing stacker if you want. And when you put this in, don't spin it too much. It needs to be more straighter than anything. So you just gently. So always back at this end. Yeah, because that, that's that's the that's closing the lips. Really? So no, you can do as you want. So it's like this, and you just put oh, really? it on the top. No, no, you're right. Yeah. yeah. So actually, you know what I've done wrong now. I need to come further. Around about there, right. about there, and forward. You're all right, mate. Now listen to me. I don't know what I'm talking about. Similar to a shaving brush, sort of thing? Yeah, similar, yeah, exactly. And then cut the excess off. And what I like to do when I cut the excess off, I layer it down. So I go snip, 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 snip. So it comes down on an angle. And then you wind your thread and, and it will catch more of it and hold it more. So you yeah, go. Like long, sort of this long. Yeah, so come and have a look at mine. That's about the, the length that you need to tie it in. 
so that length there on that 45 and what I'll do also is once I snip that back bit off is I'll come in for and then prop it up a little bit more with more time for it at the front so it's more up yeah 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 about that Okay, and then you get yourself another bunch of marabou fibres and you do exactly the same as you did with the emerging nymph. But leave some room for your hackle, alright? We're going to put in a grizzle hackle, so we're going to leave room for that. So, you, Connor, <coughs> leave room for your hackle, alright? <coughs> Yeah, you run it around like a normal dry fly. Right. Yeah. So what you do is... But not my like parachute style. No, not parachute no. style, no. Just straight. So we're going to put in the tail. About there. Yeah, tail. so you have the tail like the emerging nymph before, right. and then with the procedure extra, same yeah, same same procedure. Same procedure. Now, I'm going to give you one of these genetic feathers. Everyone should be able to tie a hackle with one feather, all right? So... What you've got to judge is... Oh, good, that's a good one. Beautiful. But hopefully it's the right thickness. You know, just, we've got to make sure it's the right. Judge the hackle. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty good. Pass that around. Mm -hmm. yeah. And <coughs> so what are you looking for, The actual when you tie a dry fly the hackle, you need the the fibers that that spiral around the hook shank they've got to be the right length in, in width so you don't want them too short you don't want them too long they need to come out just about the fiber points of the fibers just a touch past the the point of the hook in an imaginary line um, 
you can go a little bit beyond it. It's 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 a personal preference, really. Um, but yeah, that's not bad either. That's pretty good. Cool. I'll do that one and just see how it comes out. So I'll tie that on. Sorry? Yeah, between the marabou and the actual deer here. So how, how far do you take it up then? Just so you get to about the base of it, just so it looks looks pretty good. You can have it nice and thick. See, see that Chris? Mm -hmm. That's probably about what you need there. And then what you do is, we'll tie that down. Yeah, did you wrap the, you the body through a lot before? Like that. So the hackle there? Yeah. So I'll give you this bit, Pertle. There's the deer. The deer has tends to roll. There you go, take that. And then advance your thread to the hook eye. So, so that. And that way you've got the, the tail, the body, the hackle and the wing. And that's that's what the trout well, that, that'll that'll stand out like um what the proverbial you know what I mean yeah. uh, looked like the wing, but what it does it it's called the cripple dung because sometimes the duns get caught in the water surface between hatching out and not hatching out, and the trout love it because they know they're in trouble, so they just come up and go bang. Or it could be bad because they might say, well I can leave him get that hard one over there and come back to him oh, later yeah. maybe. <laughs> no, no, right? but. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really good little pattern. Now you can see, you can see how this emerging nymph and this dung are so easy to tie with the marabou feather. You can tie them really quickly, you know. You know, you can tie complicated duns like the Highland dun, which was tied by Noel Jetson. Great pattern, don't get me wrong, you know what I mean? But takes a lot of work in tying it, you know what I mean? Mm. So this is a good one to learn. And then what you can do from now on is you can start experimenting with different duns and, you know, like the Highland Dun, you know? That sh could be a next one to do, Connor, you know what I mean? And, um, but um, this, is, this is a real good way to and get straight into the action too, you know? Catching fish straight That's away. Simple yeah, simple flies, exactly. Whoa, good stuff. Thanks. No, that's really good. And what you can do to make it balanced, right? No, good yeah. Spread them out like more on that side so that, yeah, so it doesn't keel over, you know what I mean, when it lands on the water. If you have it all on one side, it's going to flip and foot roll over. Exactly. With this one, where the hack was down the bottom, that's going to sit up high. Yeah, it's going to sit up high as well. Yeah. And you gink, what you do is you gink. That first part there, yeah. you gink the wing and you gink the hackle, right? And you leave the rest by itself. Because that is what you want to be actually soaking under the water and be like that. So it's looking like it's trying to get out of its out of its emerging nymph stage into the dun, but it can't because it's you know it's in that act of actually coming out. Where if you tie, say, like a Highland dun or any of those duns that are you know more complicated to tie they're actually imitating the done after he's come out of his his uh, nymphal stage yeah. and he's actually drifting on the water. You know? This does both. So it's really good. You know, and the great thing about it as well is, like, there's always been that debate of, you know, presentation over imitation. You know, what's the better? Should you actually make your fly arrive to the trout like the natural? Yeah, you should. And should your fly be the perfect imitation, right? A lot of people say, well, no, nah, it should be just presentation. Other people that it might be, you know, stuck in their ways might say, well, you've got to have the actual perfect imitation. But the way I see it is, you have the perfect fly with the perfect presentation. That's what the aim should be, you know, to get to that stage. And then you're, and then you're laughing. <laughs> you can't go wrong. I'll give you a tip too. I'll give you a tip, right? If you're fishing done patterns where there's a bit of a wind blowing or a bit of a breeze, 
If you look at your, if you look at the Duns and they they're drifting like that, right? And your flies like that, it's not going to get taken, right? So what do you do? No. No. Pete. Hmm. You gink your leader. Yeah. Get your get your fly line, the end of your fly line, but if it's a good fly line it should float, right? So you get gink and you gink up your whole leader right to the very fly. And then it'll drift with the wind. If it, especially if you've got a shock and fly line, that can be your downfall. But if you've got a good fly line that floats and your leader's floating and your fly, alright, it'll drift beautifully. Alright? So remember that. Always remember that. Because a lot of people will just, you know, they, uh, they don't realise what's happening. You've got it, and that's presentation. It really is. Yeah, you know? it's not getting it slow. Yeah. If you're in a situation like it's a mill pond, like in that photo there, where there's no wind at all, yeah, you can just cast it out. And, ju and if it's just sitting, well, that's what the natural will do. It'll just sit. And the trout will come up to it, and you'll just go, bang, and you've got him. But if there's any wind, you need to gink it. And then sometimes you might walk at a different part of the lake and you need to ungink your fly line, your leader. Right? And I rub some mud into it or you can get some special um, stuff to actually get, get full of earth, exactly, yeah. So you can use that, you know, and you need to do that. So it can be very sort of like... Um, annoying. <laughs> well, not annoying, but sort of like it can be complicated, you know, and you need to... to uh, it just just comes through experience. It really does, you know. Trial and error, exactly. And um, the more you do it, the more you'll learn, you know. And the great thing about fly fishing, you never know at all, you know. I'm always learning. I've been doing it for 40 years, whatever. You know what I mean, Peter? You've been doing it for 40 something years as well. And um, we're always learning, aren't we, Pete? <laughs> yep. Never stop learning. And that's what I love about fly fishing. It's just great, you know. You just you just Something will happen, you're going, you're kidding me, you know? Just amazing. So it's really good. All right. Well, thanks for All right, that's enough time, all right? Yeah, no worries. Yeah, right. Now, before we go, I'll just explain the next two stages just in case um, I'm not available to do the next two stages, but I'll definitely try and, uh, and uh, do that. The next stage after the done is the, the spinner, and I told you about all about the red spinner. And then the next stage is the spent spinner. So that's when the male and the female both die. Their wings will be outstretched like that and they'll, and the, the legs and the wings will be out like that and they'll just lie on the surface of the water and the trout will mop them up. Now the best times for that to occur, you're probably saying, well, when does that occur? Well, it can happen at any time, but the most or the, the, the best times are the first thing in the morning. If there's been a major hatch of spinners mating, laying eggs, flittering around and so forth, and trout are going berserk on them, all right, the next morning when they've died, they'll be all accumulated around the edges in the next morning. And that's when the trout will also take opportunity to feed on those spent spinners. And I've got a, a pattern there. Um, if you can get onto me uh, website, um, and look up uh, the Rumpf spinner. It was a fly developed by John Rumpf, and uh, it's absolutely it's hard fly to tie, but I've simplified it. Instead of putting in um, one, two, three, four, five, oh, yeah. six, six legs, I only put in four. All right. He actually puts in four and then ties um, the dubbing around the legs and. Oh, it's just incredible. I've done it, but it's just it's just so difficult. It's incra it's crazy. And you know what? When they told me about Noel Jetson being probably the best fly tyre, I didn't realise that till one day I went to his store, because you know, every time I went over to Tassie, I'd get my fishing licence, drop in there. And he'd be always out guiding, but this one year he was there. And we started talking and all that jazz, and we got onto the conversation of the best imitation and so forth. And what he said to me... He goes, um, I said to him, um, oh, the spent spinner, the best fly I've ever seen is rump spinner. He goes, oh, yeah, Johnny Rumpf, I, I know that fly, right? And he goes, um, I've got a different coloration because I took, went to my car, got out these flies and showed them to him. He goes, yeah, they're good. He goes, I've got a great coloration. I'll show you now. And he said, I'll be five minutes. And I'm standing there going, five minutes? 
right? Because these flies take me like almost three quarters of an hour to tie, maybe even a bit longer. And no kidding you, in about five minutes he come out and he had a perfect run spinner in this different coloration dubbing right in the palm of his hand. And I, my jaw just fell to the ground. I thought, you're kidding me. This bloke must be a really good fly tire. Or he's worked out maybe little techniques that make it easier. You know what I mean? And that's what you need to do. There's probably some sort of technique he does that I don't know about. And he can do it. And he does. Maybe. Well, yeah, he could have too. Yeah. But he said. But he said to me, he goes, "I'll tie you one." He said. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But you're right. He could have said that, couldn't he? Yeah. I'll tie you one. Yeah. Yeah. He should have sat me down. Show me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. So they're the stages of the mayfly. All right. And for the spinner, the best pattern is a Macquarie Red. All right. It's a fly that was, um, you know, celebrated by David Scholes and all his books. But the bloke who actually tied it and uh, who was the originator was a bloke by the name of the late uh, Max Christensen. And um, David actually sent me a Max Christensen on a, a Macquarie Red over in the mail. I got the letter and everything from David. Yeah, still got it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, while it's a lot different to the way, you know, I'd probably tie the Macquarie Red, um, David Skull said, because I gave him an example of my Macquarie Red, and he said that was pretty good. You know, so I was really wrapped with that. But uh, the Max Christian one's absolutely classic. I'll have to bring it to one of the club meetings one day and, and show the letter as well. All right, so they're the, they're the uh, flies. So Thanks I hope everyone learned something. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. No worries.